Welcome to Lack of Focus, an X-Wing Miniatures Game podcast, brought to you by Dice 8 Productions. Hello everyone and welcome once again to another episode of Lack of Focus, episode 3, live from the Century Box. I am your host, Ed Horn, and alongside me tonight, one Mr. Sean Dorsey. Sean, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Outstanding. And live from the Century Box, potentially on his lunch break, one Mr. Chris Sheriff. <laughs> Chris, how's it going, my friend? Good, good. We uh, had a bit of a change round of plans again. We we're going to have a special guest on as uh, Bruno from Millennium Condor was over in Alberta, so he came and stayed at my house. So I was like, oh, we, you can come and we'll do um, Lack of Focus. He can be a guest on that. And um, then I was like, hmm. Then we don't actually get to hang out because, you know, we're like, we talked for like three hours. So the entire time we would have been at the house would have just been sat recording the podcast. And that's so I was like, um, we'll see if we can shift it around a little bit. So, yeah, I think this I'm is not, better. I'm not going to lie. I am go- I am missing the uh, the French Canadian accent. I would have really liked to have that with a good mix of my Pittsburgh ease on top of your UK and then Sean's. That would have been great. It would have been fantastic. But uh, it would have been nice, but I understood. So we are actually doing this. I can, you're not going to get the video on this particular one, but I can actually see into Chris's work where he's in the bookstore section. Yeah, don't let Edward know. I'm sat at his desk in the bookstore, you know, hidden away. All, right. uh, all of the, the players are all upstairs playing X Wing at the moment. So I, I wanted to move away so that I don't get too much of the background noise. Excellent. So we know now that Friday nights is X Wing night at the Century Box. Yeah, well, they they have the back room book, so they can play as way to say like. Ooh. Yeah, they've got their own key and everything. Ooh, almost like a good local game store would do. Oh, yeah, it's good. I enjoy it. I'm All excited. Right, and- so we are doing this, quote-unquote, on Chris's lunch break. So we're going to try to make this a little bit of a shorter source. It's going to be mostly flight deck stuff, so we're going to try to get in stuff. But we are going to have a ton of X-Wing stuff, because Chris has actually been playing some X-Wing. So we're going to save that for the tail end. I'm going to pick up with Sean and say, Sean, what have you been doing lately, my friend? I'm literally rearranging my office. Um, I bought a new desk. I had a six-foot table. I went to a five-foot, down to a five-foot gaming table and to put the massive monitor on and everything else. But it fits perfectly. I sent you guys that picture earlier Yeah, yeah to show good. you. And then off to my right, I have a fish tank that is literally designed for shrimp in it and stuff. Um, and... That's going to get moved, and I'm probably going to transfer all those into my main tank out in the living room. And then I have another six foot table to my right, which is right now just a just piled on with crap. But that's going to be my hobby station. I bought a one of the whatever you call it, an art desk that you can hmm. tilt up and stuff. Yeah. So you know, it's not it's definitely not six. It's probably three feet wide, and that's where I'll do all my modeling and model work and stuff. I have a lamp like chris has that's a magnifying lamp and then i bought um, another smaller footer down and got my filing cabinet in here finally so i can start it and utilize it the way that i want to so that's literally been anything i've done this week gaming wise was just redoing this and then trying to get it i have a third monitor i got to figure out where i'm putting up put it on the ceiling Um, yeah, just, just lean back. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a 27 inch curve monitor. It replaced my other 32 inch that the 49 inch replaced. So I have to I have bought an arm for it, but I got to figure out how to hang it so I can use it for both spaces. But I I don't know mm-hmm. if I can do that. So that's kind of been my week and nothing really gamey wise. Um, uh, my son, we went out to Games Workshop tonight the warhammer store whatever it's called and because he ordered his thousand sun stuff to be picked up but it doesn't release till tomorrow yeah but they not officially until tomorrow at the time but, of recording anyway but they had paint in so we went out today also to go pick up paint for him because he needed corax white primer and another primer so getting those things you know we had to do tonight before it all sold out so Corax white's a little off white, you know that, right? 
Well, it's for him. He has thousand sons, so that's their. Okay, if he's yeah, it'll work. I mean, it's a... so that was one of the things that I, my son went out and bought paints uh, to paint his orcs, and he wanted to go and uh, paint teeth, and he's like, these teeth look a little gray, and I'm like, yeah, because Korok's white is an off white; it's not an actual white. You want yeah. white? <laughs> All right, so white, and then. So do you do use Carex white and then either an Agrax or um, a Seraphim yeah. Sepia over top of it, and your teeth will look fine for Ox. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. Yeah, Although I yeah. still have I still have two bottles of the old Gryphon Sepia, like the not maybe two model lines down. Uh, that's still yeah. fine. Um, I ended up using quite a bit of it over the weekend in my in my uh, uh, flight deck. I'll get to. Um, but I think it's the the, the Agrax are the same thing. They just changed the name and a little bit of the coloring. Yeah. yeah. And, and the Korax white is what Thousand Suns is supposed to be. That's their, like, prime color. You know, that little That's bit it. of off-white. If he's in the Citadel app, Sean, you, you're all over it. Don't worry about it. And, and that's him. <laughs> so he's using the Citadel <laughs> paint app and doing doing all of it. He's. I went to the store, to, went in the store, and I asked the guy, what would it cost if I bought one of every bottle of paint? And it was like 1700 bucks. For one yeah. bottle of every single pot of paint, Damn. Games Workshop yeah. does. And yeah, you don't need all of them. Um, the way I do it, Sean, is in the app, you can actually create a shopping list. And I do yeah. it by project. Yeah, I um, got to go through my paints because I have tons of freaking paint. I got a lot of Vallejo. I, I have all different types, and I have a lot of airbrush paint. And then I have what I initially bought for the Space Marines. I have a bunch of paints. I also have the old suitcase box of paints too that I'm yeah. gonna see. Like the washes are still still liquid in them and stuff. Most of the bases right. and, and paints are shit, but I'm not gonna yeah, lie. Get, there's bring- a there's an argument to be made of just like throwing those on one of the local sale groups for relatively cheap and just starting from zero. Well, that's, then you, that's, I that's mean, what I did. Because uh, just for the, the time you save, you know, I know for me. I don't have time to sit and go through all my paints. So I did, I brought all of my paints that I had to the store and just threw them in the tub for painting demo. And then I just, this is what I'm working on now. So I just got just the paints I needed for that. Yeah. And then slowly built up again. That, that's actually what I'm doing is I went out and bought brand new fresh paint like a month and a half ago. So I have a lot of the paints that I need, some they were out of. So I still have yeah. to get those, but I, I put mean, them I in the I quantify this was pre EV, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. yeah there's, I will there's, give you one tip though, Sean. What I would do uh, when you do actually start slinging paint onto models, uh, take a photo of one of your models with all the paints that you use to do it. And the reason for that is similar to a situation that I bumped into over the, the past weekend. I went back to an army that I haven't painted in years. And it wasn't so much the original paint scheme that I had to remember. It was the basing theme. And I was surprised that I couldn't remember what paints I had to use. So I actually had to do a little bit of experimentation to get the base right. And I still don't think I got it quite right, but I got it close enough. Because I honestly could not remember what colors I used to paint my bases. So what I'm doing is whatever I'm using for that, I'm putting it in here. So I have all the colors that I'm going to use. So I have them always on hand. The rest will be stored wherever i'm gonna store them and then what i'll do is when i'm done pull all like you said pull all the paints out put the model next to it and then or put a model next to it and then take a picture like you said so that i remember because i will never remember if i don't do something like that but yeah i'm gonna use these to to kind of corral everything so i because i'm pretty good at losing things so well, I, I thought that I, like, legitimately, my paint schemes, I thought that I remembered. And from for building, the painting the models, I absolutely remember. I remember every detail of what I needed to do. What colors I used, what washes I used, what highlights I used. I knew all of that. I got down to the last step of painting the base, and I'm like, I don't remember where I started. And I'm going through all of my paints, and when I started getting back into 40K this year and started painting models again, I had to toss out a bunch of my old paints that had been dried out. And I was right. doing so because I lost which colors I, I had. So when I went out and bought all new colors, GW had shifted to their new uh, formulas and their new paint schemes that they're used for how they sell. You know, you have bases, you have layers, you have, mm-hmm. you know, like all of that had changed in the time frame between when I last painted my Tyranids until I was painting them now. So I, 
I didn't even know what colors I was trying to like. So they have translations. You can go out and find, hey, if you used, I don't know, snot green before, it's this now kind of thing. Well, I didn't right. even green. remember what, what's that? Swap stone green now. Yes, yes. Or moot, or moot green. Or moot, you got moot. moot green. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing I got were these. The Warhammer base. Oh, the Sector Imperialis base. Ooh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So I got a box of these. So the so first like models, the that's first like models I did were all these. on your car, man. That that that's the that that's the extra bonus. Yeah, yeah. So I did this, and then I'll figure all this crap out as I go too. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, it's a uh, like I said, I'm hoping I can do it this weekend. But I got five projects that I need to accomplish and. I'm trying to make this priority one, but it's not. Yeah, well, Our models not gonna... are never going to be priority one, Sean. Not, not when it's like real life stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, I have a bathroom door I got to do. I got <laughs> a lamp for my dining room I got to do. Um, so I have other stuff that has to get done. I got to mow this weekend. So we'll see. We'll see if I get to the gaming portion. And um, well, I did. I did scrap my old airbrush booth that I had built because. Aww. Well, the fan just was. I I thought the fan was bigger than it was for some reason, and it just wouldn't push it through the how I wanted it to. So I bought one of the uh, paint booth things that you can get. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I replaced it with a. It's smaller and and a little more easy probably to put away. So I got that, and that'll be nice to have, you know, for when I'm airbrushing and stuff. So I'm getting to the point now. It's getting to that time of the year as we are in August of 2021 that it's going to start getting colder. So I need to start getting all of my models primed because that's the mm-hmm. I do that outdoors with the old rattle can priming method. Yeah, and it's painting in the winter in Western Pennsylvania is the worst because unless you do the Sean method and have a paint booth bedding booth setup where you can actually do that indoors, you can't prime. And so you, you need a, a, you need a temperature of above 45 degrees, preferably yeah. with no little to no humidity to be able to do it. So like bec- the paint blisters, whenever it's on the, on the model, sometimes if it's the high humidity, because the moisture gets trapped behind latex paint and pushes off through the latex. So like you really want like a mid humidity, warm day but not like sweltering hot where the paint literally dries in midair as you're trying to paint your models and you're just dusting them you're not doing it so if i'm going to prime marines what i need to do is i need to in the next couple of weeks i need to buy all of the marines i intend to paint over the winter get them assembled and painted in the next couple of weeks so that means we're gonna buy like three combat patrols because i want two of the dark angels one and i want one of the death watch one because i want the aggressors because i think they're cool even though nobody plays them i don't care they're really really cool <laughs> i have so, a, i i just bought a new dehumidifier uh, so that's... so what i'm going to do is when i prime them i'm going to immediately bring them in back inside and then i'm going to put them in the room that's already been dehumidified yeah that's probably that's right that's the right way to go. imagine not living in alberta and needed to like dehumidify anything yeah <laughs> I mean, the only time I would need a dehumidifier is like if I'm which we're in the shower. Right, right. Yeah, some days here in Omaha, even with the air conditioning going, it's like you step out of the shower into the shower. Yeah, it's that bad. It's just yeah. insane how bad humidity is. But I got it's right in the mid late August. Like that's the time for it. It's like it's just yeah, it, it's muddy. 32 degrees here. Yeah. In like real in real life temp- temperatures, not in one of your one of your fake stuff is. <laughs> I got I got into the car yesterday. It was ninety five here and about so, thousand percent humidity. So it was like walking through soup. It was oh. I had to get to a store early today. Um, so I picked. Oh, I'll get to it later. But um, I basically I car swapped with Jill and um, got into the car that had been parked in Calgary all day, and it said it was forty five degrees Celsius in the car. <laughs> wow. So I couldn't, I trying to drive a car with just a palm of your hand, just on a steering wheel. If you don't want to grip it. Yeah, Which part of my hand am I willing to sacrifice? Yeah, that's, that's, that's every life? day in the, that's every day. That's, I don't have a garage. So, so that's every day in my life in the summer. Mm-hmm. You, the good thing is my windows are tinted some. So, you know, it's a new car with the new tinning on the windows. So it's not as hot as if it was blistering sun, just baking in, but. Yeah, it, it sucks. Also, 
We've also embraced a full-on antisocial life in the summer. I don't open any of the curtains or any of the blinds or anything now. Yep. It's like blinds and curtains all closed all of the time, so yep. we don't get any of the heat coming in. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm actually, as my windows get replaced, I'm buying thermal blinds. Mm-hmm. So they are. block the they block the the heat coming in. But I also got the it's the UV resistant windows, the double pane argon UV resistant style windows. So it when I replaced the three south windows, you could absolutely tell the difference. You know, just from literally the old you know hundred year old windows to the windows that are now in there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get these done by next year <laughs> the whole house the, the whole house. house makes a huge difference so yeah. anyway that's that's been my week um i don't oh, like i said i don't know where it'll go next week but you know we'll see all right well i'll move on to mine before we uh, put the cherry on top with all the x-wing talk that chris is going to have uh my week uh brady standard week actually um my wife and kids were away for the weekend i was all by my lonesome so I do what any party animal would do when they're home alone without wife and kids. I spent uh, two days painting up a Tyranid Trion model. Um, (laughs) Six hours on one day, three hours on the next day. So a grand total of like nine hours I put into this model over the course of the weekend. But it was beautiful whenever it was ready to get on the table and get blown off the board. Turn to by the only gunfire that it saw the entire game as Chad's obliterators blew it completely off the board. New painted model syndrome. Yep, therefore fulfilling the prophecy that Chris put down, like anytime a new painted model comes on the board, it's the first thing that dies, which it absolutely was. But I did post pictures of it. It's in the uh, the Dice Hate uh, uh, Discord. Discord, yeah. Um, that I, looked I, good, man. I was really pleased with it. It had been a really long time. Like, I know that I had painted the Swarm Lord. I think when I first started getting interested in 9th edition, I I had the Swarm Lord model. I went up and bought... The, so the, the catch is, so my Swarm Lord model is a metal Swarm Lord model. And the reason why it's metal is because I have the old school metal big um, t- uh, Hive Tyrant. Yes. And I just snapped the arms off and put Swarm Lord arms on whenever I bought my Flying Hive Tyrant, which is going to be next on my painting table, actually. So now mine's a heavier, chunkier one. And then it, I think I may have told this story on the podcast before, but I went out to go and prime it in the night. And a big wind caught up because I I don't know how anyone else does it, but I always prime my stuff in a cardboard box so I don't get overspray and hit other people's cars because I'm outside and I'm near, you know, it, it you can get that. You can get overspray that goes over to your neighbor's yard and then you're painting your neighbor's car. And then that's a lovely cleaning bill, just so you're aware. Um, so I was painting mine in a cardboard box. I'm on the cardboard box and I'm painting it. And then this big wind comes up and poof, knocked him right over. Um, shattered the base that he was on because it was the, the old school metal ones had this little metal peg that you actually drilled a hole in the base into so you could put it in so it would hold it down. So it shattered that base, popped the arms off, so I had to glue those back on. But I ended up getting a um, a resin uh, base for it where he's like standing on this pile of skulls. So it actually worked out in the end to the to, to the best. But my point is it's been in that long since I had actually painted a, a Tyranid model. So putting nine hours into a model over the weekend was fantastic. It worked. It came out great. Looked beautiful on the table. And now I'm getting to, I'm beginning to earn a reputation at our game store because I'm the guy that's always showing up with a fully painted army every time I show up. There we I, go. I've been showing up with Necrons and they've been fully painted. And then I shifted armies uh, this past week to play Chad. And went with a completely different army. I think Chad's been kind of struggling in ninth, and I don't know that it's necessarily entirely his fault in that the the poor Chaos Space Marines are so weak. They are so weak in comparison to other armies that are in ninth edition. They don't have a ton of AP. His Marines are still at one wound. They like he, he just doesn't have enough oomph behind him. So I decided to dial it back a little and go with another army from eighth edition that hasn't gotten a ninth edition uh codex yet so we're kind of playing on a level level playing field and that was a much much closer game um Mm. i only had the swarm lord um three hive guard and a unit of termagants that were about to get eaten by abaddon but we had to call it a game at turn four um so overall much much closer game i think i still ended up pulling the win up for that one because i had gotten a whole bunch of objectives early but legitimately, I blew all of my command points on turn one. I started off with 13 command points and blew nine of them on the first turn to wipe out his entire left flank. And the, it was he had a Predator on the board. He had two Obliterators on the board, a 10-man Tactical Squad, and a 10-man um, Cultist Squad that all got wiped out on turn one by a massive 20-man Gene Stealer Rush, which was awesome because I love Gene Stealers. 
And then on the subsequent turn, he completely annihilated my right flank. Like Mm. everything gone, everything's gone. And I'm like, Ooh, that's kind of scary. But luckily for me, I was able to hang on to a couple of objectives and, uh, and hang on for the win for that one. So as I was saying, my next, my future plans for the, this week, I think I need to start. I've got all of these Marines back here from the Indominus box set that I've got to prime this weekend, which is part of my plan. As soon as this damn Marine lets up and then I think I'm going to break down and get those combat patrol boxes because I do need to, because it is, it, Cold weather, I mean, I know it seems crazy right now, but cold weather is coming and it's going to come sooner rather than later. And I'd rather get them primed and ready to go. So I have something to paint over the uh, over the winter. That being said, it was so much fun painting a larger model. Like you kind of get so focused in on painting the infantry scale models, like doing little bits and pieces here. And I do everything in batch painting. So like if I'm going to paint Necron Warriors, I'll take 10 Necron Warriors and I'll paint them from beginning to end. Like. You know, all right, they've all been primed. So now um, I'm going to do the blue on the shoulder pads. I'm all going to get the blue on the shoulder pads. And then I'm going to do the gold. All of them are going to get gold. And then I'm going to do my washes. And then I'm going to do my highlights. And then I'm going to do my bases. And then I've got a full 10-man squad, you know, a 10-man squad fully painted. But to just sit down and focus on one model, it was like watching one of Chris's streams. To sit down and focus on one model for that amount of time, to be able to put that much kind of time and effort into it was a lot of fun. I really did enjoy it. Can't do it every weekend because, you know, wife kids family life but to have a weekend to be able to do that was really a lot of fun that's good Uh, i didn't stream this weekend so i was sad i know so and i didn't know that in advance like i i knew i wanted to put the amount of time in for the the trigon and get it painted my hope was that with sunday with chris was coming up was i do have a five-man um assault intercessor squad primed because i need to test my paint scheme because like in theory i know what i want to do i've i've used the citadel paint thing i'm going to go with a you know a, a sear gray primer and i'm going to do the purple contrast paint and i'm going to do the gene stiller purple highlights and then i'm going to try to get my eyes down like i have an idea of how i want to paint them but i've never painted a, a primaris marine before i've painted marines before but i've never painted a primaris marine and i genuinely in my head don't haven't figured out all the details of how they're going to look because they are going to be purple marines that are i swear not emperor's children so i don't know do i legitimately just go completely heretical and go purple with gold trim or do i try to like oh they're not they're not emperor's children they're just purple and go with something different like a silver trim i don't know i haven't decided yet how i want to do the accent colors because i like i'm trying to go through my color pie to see what are good accent colors and one of the good accent colors for purples are either your reds and blue so i could easily see like like all space marines always have like these long flowing uh capes because they're supermen of course um and sometimes they have these little talbers these little the the cape that goes over the cod piece kind of thing um and so i'm like do i go purple and red does purple and red look good or does purple and blue look better so i need to paint up a couple of test marines to see which paint scheme i do enjoy or that i want to paint to so that was going to be my project on Sunday, and it got taken from. So I'll do it this Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I've got. Um, hopefully, um, I'm going to get the uh, at least the Beast Nagger of Orc Boys built because I spent. Um, I can't remember what. Maybe it was. I can't. My, my week is so crazy. It was one day. I was like, okay. I'm going to sit and I'm going to build these orcs. Now I got the character and four orcs deep, and then I was like, I'm done. I'm going to bed. And I've not had a chance to sit down with them again since then. So I'm like, oh, this is supposed to be done by the end of the month. And I've built four orcs. Yeah. You just need a a, a good build session. I've got to do the same thing, too, because in the same light that I've got stuff I want to prime, I also want to start finish my replacement project of I have a whole bunch of old um, Necron models. I want to retire. I got to I did get to finish my I think I may have mentioned this last show, but I did finish um, my 10 man squad of Immortals which allowed me to take my, at the time, $100 squad of um, uh, Necro Necro Immortals. The old Metal Immortals used to be $10 a blister with one model in them. So to run a full 10-man squad of Immortals back in those days was $100. It's the same reason why I never got into Sisters of Battle until they came out in plastic, because a 10-man sister squad was like $120 to do a 10-man sister squad. And you needed three of them to be able to play it like like it, it was easily one of the unless you're playing forge world and you're playing like death guard or, 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 or i'm sorry death core Cree. Yeah. like that was like one drop of, troops at least drop troops that's another good one i uh, did that one yep like one of the single most expensive armies to uh to buy in 40k was 
um, the the old sisters of battle. So when they came uh, to plastic, oh man, that was so so exciting. So I can't wait to see those. I undid. I I had this thing in my head where I wasn't going to look at the art codex until I'd built and painted all of the arcs from the box. Because oh, the beast the beast snagger box comes with twenty beast snagger boys, like three of the squig riders and a character and oh, stuff. Man. And I was like, oh, this would be fun. And then you get a codex, and then. I was moving stuff out of the um, the painting area, so I, was, I just had a quick flick through. I was like, "Okay, so twenty arcs is like two hundred points." So it's, it's more expensive than I expected them to be, but still not good. Well, <laughs> I've got like less than five hundred points in that box, probably. Correct, correct. But it, the, those beast naggers, and I can I speak not necessarily from experience because I haven't played against them just yet. I did play Logan uh, two weeks ago. Um, but he wasn't running the new codex rules yet because they hadn't updated. Um, he didn't get it updated rules. I'll leave it at that. Uh, but he had updated rules uh, this past week, and Gabriel got the opportunity to play him, and that was a brutal army. The entire army's toughness five. So like yeah, he's running three, strength five for beef snaggers as well. Yeah, three yeah. twenty man squads of strength five times to five. Now, now I still haven't quite gotten the full story because it doesn't make sense to me. His ma- Gabriel's main complaint was that, well, his entire army has a six-up invul save. I'm like, yeah, but it's a six-up save. Like, if you put bolter fire into them, a standard 10-man tactical squad should blow five or six of them up. Um, so, like- I've not read it off, but there's another real um, So, if you shoot at them, or hit them with a weapon that isn't strength eight or higher, the best you can wound them on is a four-up. Yes, yes. So you yeah. can shoot them with strength seven guns, and it's still a four up. Yes, and yeah. then they've got a six up in one. Yes, they're, they're, like, yeah, it's cool. I'll, I'll take it. They they are so of course it does. It didn't hurt that. So I think Gabe took turn one. Gabe was playing Space Wolves again. He was really confident going into that game because he thought that he was going to do quite well against the list. Because of course, even at fifteen hundred points, Gasgul is a force to deal with. Um, so I think. Oh, it's not beast snaggers. It's cheating. Hold on, it was gas pool, three <laughs> 20-man squads of beast snaggers, I think two squads of, two min squads of uh, mega knobs, and a couple of def copters to go out and grab objectives. That's all that was there. they were there for. And Gabe goes, so here's how my, here's how it goes. I have first turn, I move forward a little, I blow a couple of models off the board. On the very next, on his very first turn, he makes, he makes five charges, succeeds in five charges, and annihilates three quarters of my army on the first turn. He said that game was over turn one. Shouldn't have moved forward, then, should he? That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know how I'm going to deal with that army. I'm like, simple, back up. <laughs> like, <Yep>. back up. <laughs> that's Start that's... close, move backwards. Yeah, like, you don't... Oh. The Space Wolves are a really close combat-oriented army. Like, Gabe genuinely thought that his four attack base armies versus, you know, Logan's was actually going to be... But the catch, of course, is he's got 20 models that are going to swing four or four times each in close combat. You you can't give them the charge. Yeah, you can't let them have the charge. That's the catch. Or if you're going to do it, you put speed bumps in. And that's one of those basic 40k tactics. It's all just learning and stuff as well. Uh, Once in... All the new stuff comes out as well. There's a bunch of stuff in the codex that doesn't have models yet. So, because obviously really? it's like a pre, yeah, there's a bunch of beast snagger stuff that doesn't have a model yet. Okay, right. But I mean, it's not so that box. It's interesting when they started do they started doing these boxes. That box set isn't the official release. The official release doesn't come until September, and you'll probably get those boxes yeah. in September. It's I'll just wait till like, October. Yeah, worked over exactly. It's not yeah. like what they did I'm whenever. Sure. So I don't know if I've ever shared this. Note. Like, so I had to. I made my own. One of the other things that's going to go on my paint table here soon. Way back in when we're going to take you back in the before time. Um, when the fifth edition Space Wolf Codex came out, um, Games Workshop had this funny little habit. Uh, they had two codexes, three codexes in a row. Actually, not. I'm thinking about it. The Necrons, the Tyranids, and uh, the Space Wolves, where they did this, where they released a codex that had rules for models in them, but did not have models. For them, and some of the examples, the one, the biggest examples at the time was um, Thunderwolf Cavalry. So when that book, that codex got released, you saw what Thunderwolf Cavalry looked like. You saw the statistics for them, but you didn't have models. You couldn't field them because you couldn't buy models for them. Which is where companies like, oh, I don't know, Chapter House Miniatures said, oh, we'll go and make generic wolves with a little seat that you can put a Space Marine on with legs, and all you have to do is put the torso on because there was 
a, a need for those models because they were really, really good. Very similar to like the, the Tyranid drop pod models or the Turvagon model from the Tyranid Codex. Like there were rules for them, but Games Workshop never released a model for them until much, much later. And there's some, there's even one model from the Tyranid Codex, the, the Doom of Malatite, that they never released a model for. I mean, took out the Codex because of Chapter House. <sighs> But they still could have released, like, you had to, like... They can't. Like, they they couldn't. If it, yeah, because Chapter House did one. So if Games Workshop releases one, they are then liable to get sued from Chapter House. Oh, is that... Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So, well done. Thanks, Chapter House. Ruined it for everyone. But somewhere, somewhere in the vault... No, I'm sorry. Were... So I'm, I'm doing it wrong, aren't I? God, I forgot. I'm actually logged in for the internet, so I have to actually say, God damn it, Games Workshop. How dare you enforce your IP law as the world yeah. makes you... All right, so you and I are in agreement in in that I've the more and more I keep listening, we'll get out. Oh, that's a tangent, but the more <laughs> and more I keep looking into that, like everyone's making this big stink about Warhammer Plus. Like, oh, they had all these animators that were on, you know, YouTube that were doing all these funny, you know, animated videos, like things. And the 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 case in point is always the Astartes video. The Astartes video is fantastic. I love what the guy did. And then Games Workshop hired him uh, when they decided to go over to a streaming service. Now, whether the streaming service is or isn't a good idea. I'm sorry to say that that is where we are going in 2021, our streaming services. That's genuinely where we're going. So Games Workshop is going to produce their own content that involves animated um, content, which includes a TV show that they intend to produce on Warhammer Plus, which is something that we Warhammer fans have been screaming about. They ended nice up, and hard, isn't it? Yeah, but they, they ended up shitting out the Ultramarines movie and such a I own that. I've got a Quetz edition version of the Ultramarines movie. So do I, the tin and everything. And it was, I mean, don't get, like they had Terrence. It's terrible. It's terrible. It was, it, was, it was Space Marines walking the movie. Is <laughs> Give me a second. Um, I've just got to answer. Um, sorry. There's someone yeah. asking a question. That's okay. Trying to do your job. Imagine that. It was basically Space Marines walking the movie. The The plot was really thin. I was really disappointed because Dan Abnett was the one that wrote the story. And he's one of my favorite Black Library authors. But overall, the product that Games Workshop eventually did produce, the, the CGI looked like it was 10 years old whenever it was produced. God help you if you watch it now because it looks much, much worse. My point being, yeah. when Games Workshop decided that they are going to go down the route of a streaming service, which... I'm not saying it's a bad idea from a, if I'm a company that's trying to survive in 2020, 2021, it's kind of where it's kind of where things are going. So I can't necessarily blame them for that. And they are, they may have had kid gloves before with all the folks that were doing it, but whenever they start producing their own content, we don't want to have a situation just like Chris had pointed out where they couldn't produce something because someone else had produced something and they're potentially stamping on someone else's uh, intellectual property. Now, the catch to that is, if I were to sit down and write a Superman story right now and make a Superman animated video and put it on YouTube, I would half expect that DC would be all over my shit for using their IP because I've monetized my video and I'm making money off of their IP. It's not the same thing as... Well, I'm it's, a it's as simple as, like, I've had to move into a bookstore because you can't hear the music here. Yeah. Like if yeah. if we did this and it picked up, like we used to get it when we streamed on the Mez and forgot to turn the music down. If you you catch like thirty seconds of a song, and then the entire recording it ends up muted. Yeah, like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I there is a part of me that is going to miss some of those animated channels. But Games Workshop reached out to the cream of the crop of those content creators and either brought them on in contract work as in they're now working for games workshop continuing the work that they did except yes it's behind a paywall welcome to a games workshop hobby everything they have is behind a paywall i, I heard a really good analogy about this from um one of the esports um podcasts i listened to and um we were talking about like 15 years ago 10 years ago whenever it would be like you and your group of friends are sat there like, oh, have you seen this new thing on Netflix? And the cool guy's like, oh, no, I'm just going to torrent it tonight. Yeah. Like, the guy who says, no, I haven't watched that on Netflix yet because I've got to download it on the torrent now is just a fucking loser. Well, like, I, do, I, I think <laughs> one of the things I look at with Games Workshop, I'm new to it, you know, I'm new to the Games Workshop side of things as far as recent history. And for what is it like 11 bucks or 12 bucks, whatever it's going to, I don't know what it's going to cost for the Warhammer plus, but getting all that content 
for that little amount of money and monthly and a figure and yeah, it'll cost you X amount of dollars a year. But I mean, I'm doing that in Disney or Netflix right. or all these others. And it's, I just think they're smart to do what they did and whether it kills a, whether it kills a creative community, it's not going to kill the gaming community. No, no, I'm like, it's stupid because like, you can't complain about a company existing in the world because that's the world we live in. Like you, you can hate, you can hate the fact that there's a litigation culture, but it exists. So yeah. you got to do, whole, you know. You don't hate the player. Yeah. They're and, doing what they have to do. I don't. I and again, maybe this is me, GW fanboying boying it. Like there, so the argument that a lot of folks are using is that the reason why they got interested in the Warhammer 40k universe in the first place because they were. I, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> Well, I mean, well, I mean if, if, if they ever, walked, you. If they ever I, I, walked into a game store, they would have seen it. Yeah. Right. You, you know what that sounds like, Ed? That sounds like the person who, like, they saw someone being abusive to a waiter in a restaurant. So they stood up and said, oh, don't treat your service staff like that. And then everybody clapped. It didn't happen. They just made that up because it's yeah. easy to type bullshit on the Internet. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So my well, point I, is, while I'm... I guess my problem is, is like I guess I haven't watched a lot my the the Warhammer 40k content that I consume on the internet either through Twitch or through YouTube isn't the animated stuff isn't the the user don't get me wrong I watched Astartes Astartes was good that was probably like that's what I wanted the Ultramarines movie to be was Astartes I, it, an hour and a half of that would have been great and we're probably going to get that because the creator got moved over but the content that I watch is not going to be affected by this. Most of the stuff I watch is either battle reports or tactics videos or painting stream. And GGW, while they are going to do their own content on Warhammer Plus that falls into those same categories, they are also not going to go after those content creators. So legitimately, from me personally, that doesn't affect me. It genuinely doesn't. If well, I wanna... if, if Warhammer, if, if Games Workshop wanted to be petty... They would go after every person who does a painting stream on a Warhammer model. I don't no, really I, think it's, it's no, not no, even no, worth no, going down into this, that part. I, 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 I get that, but like, I'm saying it's is just that, people are stupid, and people are exactly. always going to be stupid, and it's cool to hate Games Workshop. That's literally yeah, what it is. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. My son and I were talking about this coming back from the Games Workshop store, but to get into the game, if you're going to become a competitive player in this, it costs a lot of money, you know? If you're going to go and try to compete in next week's tournament, 2,000 point tournament, it would cost you a lot of money to get into it. But I hate to say it, that's with every game. You know, every, I mean, well, I'm just saying, you know, every, it's not even every a game, game it's there's an investment. There's an investment in a yeah. hobby. You know, being able to play X Wing, you'd still have to drop about 100 bucks for everything just to get a starter set know, and a couple a starter. of I, mean, I think, right. This, I'm not going to lie, there is probably a level of elitism in this statement. But like, I used to live 20 minutes away from St. Andrews. I, when I, I, used to, I didn't play golf a lot. I go maybe t- twice a year. So I, I didn't play golf in St. Andrews. I played golf on the municipal golf course in Dundee because it was £140 for a membership, not like a £1,000 for a membership with my military discount. I couldn't afford to play St. Andrews, so I didn't. Yep. If you can't afford to play Warhammer, play X-Wing. Right. If you can't afford to play X Wing, play on TTS, I don't care. But yeah. you, know, See how you know what I mean? I, I don't See how complain. Used to go because I mean, legitimately, I'm anyway. But it's I, one of those. Like, I I don't think I I would love to own a Porsche. I can't afford the brake discs on a Porsche. Never mind a Porsche. I don't right. write on the internet about how evil a Porsche are for not giving people cars for the same price of a 1994 Ford Mondeo. Yes. Yeah, that's I mean, wrong, like in the early, like when I started playing this game, I started playing this game the tail into third edition, fourth edition. I did not have the level of disposable income that I have now, so I bought models oh. sporadically. So all of the models that I have over the three armies that we've built up, Gabe's got a, an orc army as well. That has been built up over time, and people see that and go, "Ooh, I want to do this game," and they go, "Oh, the barrier to entry of this game is so big. If I want to play at the tournament level." I have to drop, you know, two thousand dollars. We don't. The barrier to the entry doesn't have to be that. They have a command box that you can get, or they can have a, the elite box you can get. You can get. St- you start off small and work. Yeah, your way I, I just went through that with you know the descent. You know the new descent version. Yeah, where it's one hundred and seventy-five bucks to buy, but 
if you don't have 175 bucks, don't bitch about the price. Right. You know, if you want to play, find somebody who in your community has the game and go play with them, you know. But all the negative stuff that kept coming out about that was it just kind of made me laugh, but it was sad at the same time because people were complaining about that price. Well, then people were complaining about the art. Well, you're probably complaining about the art because you complain about something else, you know, or you're just perpetually going to complain about it. And you know what? I bought it. I got to play the first mission or half of the first mission and i had a great time yeah very cool game yeah you know? I mean, so like, i'm still going on hold so i need to uh i need to build up some star credit so yeah it's it's worth it chris trust me <laughs> my point I guess, the point i guess i'm trying to drive at is like i am we talked about this off in our in our um chat log uh, that we've got going i absolutely am going to be pine for the thing that i wish that we were getting in the u.s is the warhammer imperium magazine uh the u.s doesn't get that yet I think we start mm. getting it next year. Like that, that I 100% buy into because I think it's yeah. like, I think it comes out to like $12 us and $12 us a per month. They send you models. And if you continue the subscription throughout the year, by the end of the year, you'll have two full armies and terrain to go with them. It's fantastic. It's an, it's an absolutely amazing product and at a discount, which G G games workshop is not particularly known for uh, doing gigantic uh, discounts like that. So like it's, I think they're going in their direction. Like you have to understand this company is facing the fact that 3d printers are a thing. Now 3d printers are in the wild and they are dirt cheap in comparison to where they were five years or even eight years ago. Now you oh, can get a I almost pulled, I, I almost pulled the trigger on a resin 3d printer. <laughs> right. Like, and, and even that was like what? Three, 400 bucks. Maybe some of them. 100, 179 bucks. Right. And five years ago, that was a $2,000 piece of equipment. Now yep. it's not. And yep. they're getting better and better. The resolution's getting better and better. And at some point in time, Games Workshop has got to come to the come to the grips of the fact that like it's entirely possible for people that are 3D. That's why that's why everyone made this big bitch about well, no 3D printed models with 3D printed bits at Games Workshop official events. They're trying to protect themselves from the eventuality, the the flow of eventuality, which is gonna happen is that people are just gonna be printing armies themselves. If they were smart. They would lean into that eventually. I don't think they're ready to do that. I don't think they're in the position right now to shift their oh. business model to just selling the CAD files for those. But well, eventually, I could see that happening. I think it would be I, smart I for think, them to start. I uh, think that we're massively off topic and that Games Workshop is primarily a miniatures company and they will not do that for a long, long time. And I don't yeah. think that there's any need for them to because whilst like geeks and like... That's it, harsh because I, I I've had a three D print, but like the people who have three D printers weren't buying Games Workshop stuff anyway. Yeah, yeah, I right. well, agree. The 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 people who you're talking about who were three D print an entire army are the people who would have bought third party models from cheaper sources. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's any uh... need for them to do any of that. Or the uh, oh. China, China cast or Rus Russian cast, uh, you know, Warhound Titans for 50 bucks that <laughs> like those. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're right. Way off topic. It's Warhammer 40k corner has come to a close. Let's actually close this one out a little with some actual X-Wing discussion with Chris. Chris, <laughs> what have you been doing lately, my friend? Uh, I've had a massively busy like, fortnight, two weeks, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we, um, we actually had a break. So much yeah. so that Sean's call uh, messaging on Thursday, like, do we record tonight? Like, I feel like we're recording every week. <laughs> yeah, he, um, so I think I spoke about having a meeting with, like, the owner and stuff of the store about stuff and all of that. Um, but basically, we're looking at like, events slowly starting up again, obviously, X-Wing's hey. back on in the store at the moment. But we're also implementing a bunch of new procedures and things we've never tried to do before, like charging for if you want to rent the back room overnight or like after the store is closed, it now costs money, whereas it used to be free. Like we used to, used to people, you, you give the store twenty dollars and they give you a key to the back room and a code for your alarm for the back room. But that, and then when you get them a key back, you got the twenty dollars back. That's fantastic. I well, it's not, it, no no that's moronic. That's what it's called. Yeah, for a business model, that's bad. That's terrible. Well, I'm talking from a player's perspective. From a business perspective, I don't know. Because there are businesses around here. There's a club down here um, on the other side of Pittsburgh. Otherwise, I'd hang out there more often, too, uh, called Legions. They've switched over a couple of years ago to 
a membership fee. Um, you can come in and play all you want, but you have a $10 a month membership fee. If you're in there four times and you know once a week, every week playing whatever game you're playing, it's two dollars and fifty cents whenever you walk in the door. It's pocket change. Yeah, but uh, that well, helps there's a bunch of stuff, it. but like, we're charging for the back room, so like the X Wing group's got it booked once a week. So you have a choice of paying fifty dollars a night, or you can buy a quarter that is in three months worth for five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. or you can book for a year and it's twelve hundred dollars. So a hundred dollars a month. And that we do a payment plan if you do a year. So we 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 signed up for that and so trying to figure out trying to plan it from the store side for how it's all gonna work. And then also trying to plan it from the X Wing group side for how the group's gonna make it work and how the group's gonna find the money. Um then I'm trying to plan a bunch of events as well. Um emailing a bunch of different groups. So I think I've done like 20 odd hours from home this week uh, in the last two weeks been looking after Evie uh, Evie's also been at summer camp like 9 Ooh. until 12 so I have to drop her off and pick her up and deal with all of that um, my mum's been here Bruno's been over um, <laughs> actually working in the store so every time a new group's turned up I've been trying to be here to make sure it all goes smoothly so I'm just exhausted mm. and then um, I was hanging out with Bruno and his friend from work last night, teaching them to play X-Wing, or teaching his friend to play X-Wing, who'd never played before. Um, so until that like, was like midnight, one o'clock. Then I'm here until 2 a.m., I think, tonight. Then Jill messaged us that oh, there's an extra shift going on Saturday she can pick up, which might be double time. So I've got EVN tomorrow and no lying. So I'm like, oh. But then I, I really want, I'm hoping that I'm just going to see if Evie will take the iPad for maybe an hour so I can build some more orcs. So I want to get these 20 orcs built so that I can paint them on Sunday. Yep. And then I want to have a nap so I can play some Inquisitor Martyr because I feel like I've been falling behind on that as well. So, yeah, I think I'm, all, I'm level 72 now. Oh, jeez, you guys are so much further ahead of me. Yeah, I'm, 60, we, or six, I'm 60 or 61, so I'm a little bit behind. Yeah. But I'm going to have to play some yeah. serious catch-up. Yeah. Uh, have you, you've still got all of those XP boosts, so don't you, Ed? So, I do, I do. Yeah. So I'll be able to play catch-up. Yeah. Um, but I want to do that on Saturday, and I want to stream again on Sunday. Um, I, I, this week was supposed to be so good, though, because i so got to drive down to like the uh, Family Sports Centre to drop Evie off at summer camp. And then she's only there for three hours, so I was like, well, I can go to the gym. All right, so I drop her off, grab some breakfast, go to the gym, then... Like pick her up, and then we can go swimming, and I can just do that every day. But no, I've been like, answering emails and having to get back, and um, just like random jobs came up in the house. Like, the the I got one of the like, number pad door locks, Ooh. and it just it stopped working. And it's like it's gotta just be with batteries. But like going through trying to sort that out because I've got to do it in in that three hour window when Evie's not there, which is actually only a two and a half hour window because you've got to drive there and drive back. Yep. Oh, oh, I forgot yeah. to mention, I picked up some Chris uh, luck this week. So, oh, yeah. <sighs> it's it's spreading. Sean's had some. Now, Ed, oh, man. So he, it's all coming up, Sheriff. That's what it is. <laughs> so here's mine. Um, I worked from home today. So my routine whenever I work from home is I as soon as I close the lid on my laptop, come downstairs, put the bicycle shorts on, get the get the shirt that I'm going to sweat in and I hop on and I do you know, 10 minute warm up on the bike. I do a 30 minute ride on the bike and then I do a five minute cool down. So basically I'm on the bike for anywhere for almost an hour, uh, all in told and soaking wet, drenched in sweat. Good, you know, good workout. Go up, take a shower and I'm ready to record the show. Well, good. Turn the bike on. Nothing. So I have a echelon bike. I didn't go for the full Peloton because Pelotons are way more expensive than I wanted to put in, but echelons are a really good substitute and it has all the cool stuff that I like the on demand and all that. It's got this big LCD screen in front of me. I can watch it and focus what I'm going. Here it turns out the back panel, that screen died and we had a one year warranty on it. One year and two days. Uh, one year and 11 days. Actually, 11 it days. Ex- it expired uh, you know, August 2nd of 2020. Yeah. One. Yep, and I remember you getting the bike, so I knew it was just over a year ago. 
<laughs> of course, the guy out there is like, well, you know, you could have bought an extended warranty for $75, but instead it's going to be $600 to replace the damn screen. God damn it. I, I would have told him to go fuck himself. The second he said that, I was like, right, you know what? Go fuck so, yourself. I'll get a gym membership, dickhead. COVID's over. No, well, well. So we got Obviously, close. it's not for you. Yeah. So yeah. long story short, uh, this was going to be my echelons a good company because what the guy did said, look, you're so close to the year. You, we know that we you bought it on the eight, you know, in August, but it didn't actually get to your house until such and such time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and honor the warranty. My wife and I purchased the one year warranty extension on the spot. Yeah. And they are going to send me out a replacement screen for free, but I have to wait in uh, 10 to 14 days. So I was sitting yeah. down with my iPhone glued to my bike screen <laughs> with a little clamp that I was using because I, I can tie the phone into the bike and still get my workout out. It's not the same because it's on a much smaller screen, but I still got my workout in. But yeah, like when he said that number, like set, the whole bike is $1,400 before you talk in the, the membership fee to do the, the all, to get access to all the downloadable content and all the streaming stuff that they've got. Yeah. And I'm like, that's half. That's half of what I paid for it. All right. I just have to ask, like, so what are you, like, what is that screen doing for you? All right. So this is somebody. Sorry, asked, I don't mean to caveat this, but yeah, I got to yeah, ask. This is a good, this is a good question. So one of the things that it does for me is they have live, cla they have live classes. So I'll tune in to the six o'clock or the seven o'clock or the eight o'clock classes. And you can get into the live classes and what's motive it's motivating for me. What I found um, with working and I was just what I found when I was working in the gym, I get bored and this is Ed's brain. This is how Ed's brain works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can sit and listen to music all day long and I can sit and I can do the lifting weights. Mm -hmm. But at some point in time, like I just I just get bored with it. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's keeping me engaged. Like, because I have to pay attention when they say, hey, we're going to shift up to, you know, 95 RPMs and then we're going to increase the resistance. Oh, no, you don't have to say that they can't see you. All right. So they can because there's a little webcam right there <laughs> and they can see you. My point is it's engaging. It helps me engage. Yeah. It helps keep my brain focused on what I'm trying to do. And it genuinely like after 45 minutes on the bike and 15 miles, whatever it usually comes out to, like, I don't feel like I've done 15 miles on the bike until I get off. And I'm like, wow, I'm soaking wet. And so like, I don't, it yeah. helps engage you. So legitimately that's what it does for me. Could I perform the exact same thing on a standard mechanical exercise bike? Sure. I would get bored because I had one of those. I had my whole game plan process in the beginning was that I had one of those bikes and I'd park it in front of the TV and I'd watch Star Trek and just pedal my feet. Hey, I'm exercising. You get bored. Like that. And it's just Ed's lizard brain kicking in and saying, oh, I need something to engage me to be able to be interested in it. And, it's, and there's a leaderboard. So there's a score and I can see where my score was the last time I did the bike and where my <laughs> score is at the end. So then it becomes a competitive thing. So it scratches, <sighs> it scratches its competitive itch and it keeps me mentally engaged as I'm doing. So this it. is why he doesn't play X-Wing anymore, folks, because he's too busy <laughs> pedaling in his basement. That's where he's getting his competitive side scratch. <laughs> oh, no, it's just I, I, I just translate my competitive side into everything else that I do. <laughs> that's that's yeah. what it is. I mean, that's a good idea. I just, you know, to me, it's just almost as I get where you're coming from, because when I'm at work, you know, I'll work. I have three 27 inch monitors that have 17 spreadsheets up, you know, mm -hmm. and so you're working between, and I get bored. So I turn on like lame. I bought the 25th anniversary of Les Miserables, you know, so that I could have something to listen to while I'm mindlessly going through this crap because that's what I have to do, you know. So, um, and, and maybe this is a deeper look into Ed's psyche a little bit. I feel like my brain operates on two different frequencies. So for me, for those who do not know, I think I've mentioned this about a thousand times. If you haven't picked up, Ed's a software developer and he sits down and writes code 90% of his day. So I'm just writing code, writing code, writing code. So most of the time you just see just text pouring down as I'm writing, testing code and trying to get results out of it. At the same time, Ed's listening to his podcasts. Ed's listening to some of his YouTube channels. Ed's listening to audiobooks or whatever. So all of that's happening at the same time where one level of my brain is doing coding and thinking about high level mathematics as I'm going through and doing all of this. And the second one's listening to Gaunt's Ghosts in the background kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I need, but I couldn't do A without B. If I'm doing A without this in the background, I get bored. Who a big girl. Yeah. So. 
I genuinely one of the one of the Spoilers. guys. Yeah, one of the guys that I listened to. It's a tech guy. Uh, Jay's two cents had made a comment that genuinely like kind of hit me. Kind of like, huh, that does make sense. Was that I'm a child of the '80s and the early '90s, just like he is. He's under about the same age. And he's like, he's like, I genuinely believe that I had an undiagnosed ADHD. ADD, yeah, yeah, or ADD because they yeah. didn't diagnose that kind of stuff back then. They didn't start diagnosing that until the oh, late I had 90s. the same thing. I had the same so thing. So legitimately, that's what I think it is. It's like it's the same reason why I can't be in a quiet room. It's like I need something to stimulate. Like even whenever I go to bed, I have this little app that does like thunderstorms and something. Like I need something there. To oh, I, I watch. I watch the YouTube channel Riddle. I turn Ooh. it on and just let it play all night, and then. Yep. Yep. I. I uh, you'll this catch is me. Where I get to be a horrible person. It's I, I don't think ADHD exists. I think it's all made up. I think people are all different and have different I do too. Yeah. Spans. I mean, I'm. And I'm right. in. I'm in a similar boat. Really? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm sure. I I don't know. I think this is definitely a an Atlantic Divide thing. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. I I, I, I don't feel like I need Ritalin if that's what you're asking to be able to focus and do my uh, job. No, but that's what I mean. Like, it, well, it's I, a, think, a I think I think I'm so overstimulated. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm a child of the '70s. You know, my grade school yeah. time was the '70s, early '80s, and it was the same thing where you 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 know, your your parents or guardians or whatever kicked you out of the house till the streetlights came on. So <laughs> you had to self-entertain through that whole time. And when you're doing it, you're doing 800 different things. You could be playing war one minute, you know, by yourself or with friends or whatever, and then making up another whole game. When I'm at home, a lot of times I actually have three YouTube videos going at the same time. Oh, I don't go that far. Uh, that's how bad I can get at times because I'm taking a medication that, is an anti-anxiety. It's for my nervous system, but it also affects anxiety, depression, and all these other things. So it hyper focuses me a lot of the time. But my hyper focusing is just like at work, where I'll have spreadsheets open and I know exactly what I'm doing with them. But I have to have those that many things going on for me to even like be able to narrowly focus. And yeah, I, that I agree with. Like yeah. for me, I need that to be able to. I need two things to focus on to be able to focus on one. Does that, yeah. if that makes, it makes any type of weird kind of translation. And I think Chris is right. I think that's, that's an, uh, this side of the pond thing where I, I know more Brits than Chris and they're all, they're all like, I think Chris I know more Brits than you. I, I will bet you that you, do. I'm saying I know more <laughs> you, than you, just you know Chris. Brits than, yeah, I know. Yeah. I yeah, was just being like, pedantic because I know you are. I, you're, you're being British there. Damn it. You know, not Canadian, European, British. But anyway, if he was being Canadian. He'd apologize for it right after. Exactly. Yeah. But that's my point is that, you know, all the people that I know that I know personally from Britain are a lot like Chris, where they're just where Chris Ex is always, migrants. always dragging us in from the ethereal, you know, outlying conversations, you know, because he's focused on he's focused and we're lack of focus, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've got. You guys on the left hand side of my screen, and I've got Discord open on the right where I'm monitoring that when you guys are talking, it's actually lighting up so that Craig should be recording it because we're using right. Craig again for this. Uh, Craig, the recording bot for Discord. Don't mess with us. When it Craig. works, it's been good. When it works, it's really good. And when oh. it doesn't, we have to record on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and lose uh, one of the best episodes we've ever recorded. No, that wasn't Craig. That was just the not. That was non Craig faults. It's weird. Wow, that was OBS for yeah. that one. Yeah, so I mean, everything goes wrong somewhere. <laughs> but I suppose we're still on my flight deck, uh, yeah, which is well, kind yeah, of a bunch yeah, of main we're... topic. So um, <laughs> X Wing stuff. Uh, we did have plans to actually start um, doing a, another look at like a faction focus again, because we've not really done those. For, but I think there's been a bunch of releases since we last did it. But we're going to obviously push that till next time so we can like, bring up slides and stuff and do video content for it. Yeah, and we want to put but, some time into it too. Yeah. But we're going to do a Republic faction my... focus. Start yeah, off with the Clone Wars. Time. Yeah. Um, but I've played... Um, like five, four or five games of X Wing now. Ooh. Um, since the store reopened, and I've lost all of them. It's great. Um, good, good. I, it's good. It's been good. It, it's been interesting. So a couple of games have been against like real lists, where because I've not really been following the um the online meta. Um, so it was a few things. Oh, okay, I see how all of that works. Uh, and then 
obviously there's been the, the list that I didn't really make properly because they were for fun. But I played against um, so an advert. Any list that surprised you? You're like, oh, wow, that is really good. Um, so Django Zam's going to be like a 250-point list after a points change. It's got to be. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of when we first switched and I was talking about like Fenro, Lando in the Escape, Craft, and Bubba Fett. And all of these upgrades and playing that and oh, I'm so good. At, I'm winning all of these games. And then this points change happened. It was like a 230 point list. I was like, oh, okay. Makes sense. That, that makes sense. That, <laughs> that's the exact same feel I get from that list. Uh, but it's just a bunch of bullshit cards that all um, yep. <laughs> come together. Um, but I, I play one of the games I lost. Um, I made an assumption when we deployed. This is funny. I was playing Mark. He was running an advanced census Gurry with a Virago title, a bunch of upgrades, whole upgrade. Um, and he plays Gurry all the time and has been since first edition. Um, and then four Z95s or Z95s or Headhunters, whatever you want to call them, with Dead Man switches. Ooh. Yeah. Um, and I looked and was like, okay, so 25 points a Headhunter. Um, and I was running my like 90 point Kylo and um, two 50 point Thai SFs, which are just loaded with bullshit stuff to make it the math easy. So it's like, well, if I can kill all of the Zeds, keep one of the, um, like, kill, yeah, if I kill all of the Zeds and don't, and keep both of my, one of my SFs alive, I win. If my SFs go down, it's final salvo because Guri's not going to kill Kylo, Kylo's not going to kill Guri. It's irrelevant. Um, and we got halfway through the game, and I was like, so how many points are you Z95s? It was like 24. Aww. So I was like, oh, well, the game's done, then you've won. Like, we still <laughs> had four, like 40 minutes left, but the game was over because I'd traded it in such a way that it was going to go back and forth in where, you know, how his stuff blew up with the dead man switches, where the damage was going to land and everything. And then we played it out, and true enough, he won the game by four points. Yep. <laughs> so that was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should have asked this question before we started, and I formulated a plan, because it turns out my plan was, I'm going to just lose this game on purpose. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, this is the X-Wing takeaway from today's show. <laughs> that That is still a plan, though, you know. It's, it's I mean, I, I do not disagree. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, I, I'm sure my face must have just dropped. I oh okay. Well, I um I cannot win this game anymore. So I I think we had like two minutes. But I had maybe two times where I could have half pointed Gurry, but Kyle's dice just weren't there. And I knew that was. It's always the case when you one v one in that kind of matchup with those slippery kind of ships. It's always going to be difficult. Uh, but that was a good fun game. Um, then I've actually tweaked that Kylo list, which is what I want to play tonight. So I was looking at it, I was like, well, I'm running this Kylo, which is really good fun to fly, and I'm running him with these two SFs, which are just loaded, like, initiative two SFs with automated targeting priority, concussion missile, special forces gunner, and um, passive sensors. And I was like, if I'm going to spend 100 points on two wingmen to run a three, a three ship list. Why don't I just run Von Reg and something else? Yeah. So I've got like, I've gone with the Zai shuttle with tactical officer for the um, coordinates and bio hexacrypt codes, which, which is when you lock on to Kylo or Von Reg, you can coordinate them from anywhere on the map. Yeah, um, and then if you lose yeah. it, it's not that big a deal. It's not yeah, like point. the the idea was that the the SFs are going to die anyway because you mean, they're not going to live. It was how much damage they could do while they're running. But theoretically, I should be able to do around the same. And I found that it was the exact same experience playing that Kylo list as playing my Vader and the Thai RB heavy lists. Right, it was the same list. Only instead of Vader and the Defender, you've got Kylo. It, the game is all about how much these two rocks do, like the anvil, how well the anvil does while you race kind of dances around. I was like, I don't need this place out twice. 
Right. So, yeah. Um, but that, that's good. I, I want to try and give that Vader list a little bit more um, table time. Try this new Kylo Von Reg list and then see how I go there. Well, yeah. I mean, well, there's like ambulances and police cars driving past. I don't know if you can hear that. No, nope, maybe. You can hear it all. We're good. That's it. That's um, Discord's crisp noise cancelling service mm-hmm. there. Um, yeah, what else? I've actually dumped all of my X-Wing stuff onto a table that hasn't been sorted and sleeved yet to go in the box, so I'm going to finally get that done. Because I keep going to make a list and then I can't find a card for something. So I'm mm-hmm. not going to take that because I don't know where about it's the fingers. So I'm going to finish sorting those. My plan was to do it tomorrow, but obviously Joe's now working, so that's kind of gone awry. Um, I put it yeah. in a book. Or like I, I got one of the... like. Uh... Maybe this is the Magic of the Gathering player in me. I've just got a book with all the sleeves, and I just kind oh. of flip through everything. I've got them sorted by... So maybe this is the Magic of the Gathering player in me, but I've got one of the 1600 count card boxes yep. and um, the card dividers. So I've got it sorted in the seven factions, and then the upgrades. Uh, the factions are divided with blue dividers, and then the fact the... Yeah, sorry, factions are done with blue dividers, and the upgrades are done with white dividers. And then that's how I've sorted the any faction specific upgrades go in the faction, and it's nice and easy. And one because I sleeve it all as well, it kind of there's too much room in a 600 count box for everything I own, so that's a good problem to have because yeah. I don't have to worry about new storage for a while, right? That's the biggest thing is once you start running out of storage, and you're like, shit, I got to buy something else, you know? Yeah. And then you have to split it up over multiple things. And yeah, it's just- it was in an 800 count box, so I just bought a bigger box. I started, like, and this probably, this goes back to first edition. I just started getting rid of stuff. Like, how many copies of Proton Torpedo do I really, really need? Oh, yes. That's just, but- I mean, th- this is, I think, um, like spam cards. Um, like, I might have like four or five of them. Um, a couple of you listed a bunch of in case they ever run like a dead mm. man swarm for scum or something. But yeah, I kind of just kept what I would, what I think I would ever use, and then maybe I've added like a couple. Of, so a card kind of like Predator, where I normally only use like one or two in a list. But if it goes in two or three of my lists, and I'm running because I try and build with seven lists yeah. um, every point cycle, so it's times like that where I'll do multiples, but yeah. not all, not too much. Way back in the day, whenever we were trying to like get the X Men community up and started, it made sense to have multiple copies of stuff like that because I'm mm. four or five people are dipping into my box because they need a copy of this or a copy of that. Then it made sense, but once that wasn't an issue anymore, I started shedding some dead weight. Some of the yeah. back of the book cards that uh, Sean was so popular with saying, like if I, I, how many? If I'm never going to run that upgrade, and then the only time I'm ever going to run it is if some other card comes out that all of a sudden makes that card good, two or three copies of it, and the rest of them I just started uh, getting rid of. Yeah. Uh, I suppose I'm going to have to get back to work soon, so we should oh. probably look at wrapping up. I think we're over an hour anyway. But um, yeah, we're over an hour. I was going to say... Probably not for a good chunk yeah. of it. <laughs> Some. Ten minutes. Um, 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 maybe not even ten minutes, but yeah, I, I mean, I dropped a banger. Check your opponent's points on the list before you make a plan. You know, that's all you need to know. One, it, only one it, takeaway from today's show. Yeah, if your plan is outpointing them and and going to a draw at the end, then yeah, that's probably you'd want well, to validate. When you've Trust got the end validate. game, yeah. If the end game is a stalemate, you need to know how to get the lead. Yes, yes, that's because I. I effectively I should have ignored the Z95s and gone all out to try and catch Gurry, which is going to be hard with three ships but not impossible. It's going to be easier with three than it is with one at the end. But, hey-ho. Agreed. Um, I was going to say I finished watching Bad Batch today. I think Sean's been watching that as well. Yep, I finished uh, it today uh, also. I'm going to have to play catch up then. Oh, I such, such a good, such a a good series. One first. Yeah, Such a good well, series. We want to do an in focus, so we could do like a Disney Plus in focus at some point, and uh, oh, try and you, get that you scheduled. Know we're going to get stuck on one show for an hour. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll just pick one. Yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. We could do multiples and do a in focus Disney series or something. We can. Yeah. That'll work. Uh, um. Yeah, as well as I'll do all of the normal stuff. I I don't what? have it up in front of me now because I'm on my laptop, but um. 
make sure you check out the Discord. It should be linked in the show notes, but it's Dice Hate Productions on Discord. You can email us at lackoffocuspodcast at gmail.com. You can sign up for Patreon if you would like to support the show at um, Lack of Focus on Patreon or at Dice Hate on Patreon as well. And um, yeah, we're on Facebook, Lack of Focus Podcast. Uh, all of the links should be in the show notes. If you're listening to me say this, you should already know where to find us anyway. Um, yeah, I've actually been pretty impressed. We're still kind of steady on our listener base after all of this um, end times, uh, you know. So I'm really proud of you all. Thank you for yeah, uh, sticking with us. Give, yeah, I do want to give a shout out to the uh, the Discord community. One thing I do want to bring up, I might, forgot to mention in my in my flight deck, never got to. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, who may not be paying attention on the uh, D&D side of it, uh, our D&D campaign is getting ready to wind down to a close, and we're going to be taking a bit of a hiatus. Um, mostly, Sean's got things he's going to be doing, and he's not going to be available for a bit. So we're going to be taking a bit of a break from D&D here coming up shortly, and one of the things I asked Chris to do was to create an alien RPG channel for me, because my hope is to run a couple of the one-shots in the time off that we're going to have so if it's something that you are interested in you've heard ed talk about it um let me know uh just hop into the ed's rpg channel uh and let me know if there's something you'd be interested in playing the second thing that came out of that of course is because i think greg knows my inner psyche he's also aware of how much of a like i i went through this thing where i was trying to find the best sci-fi rpg that i could find and i came across the traveler rpg by mongoose the second edition one and of course greg's apparently a gigantic fan of it and maybe volunteering to run a traveler campaign coming up soon. So I think he's looking into the best method to do it. I know you can do it in Roll20. I don't know if you can do it on Foundry or any of the others, but there may be a traveler campaign. Now, I've never played the game. I've read the book one time. I pulled the book out of, uh, uh, blew some dust off the book this uh, this this past week so I can uh, start playing catch up. But there may be a new or new, multiple new uh, campaigns that we're going to be putting out here shortly, either the Alien One-Shots or Traveler, or potentially both. So Yeah, I think the plan for the one-shots was for them to be pretty open-ended as well, wasn't it? So if listeners want to jump in, yeah. we'll try yeah. and, like, if too many people want to play, we'll do, like, a random draw. Like, you don't have to be a patron or anything like that. It's just something fun. So if you want to hang out with us and play, um, oh, my God, I hope it's not in my chest, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> then, um, you know, <laughs> It'll be fun. It'll be fun. Uh, so I'm looking, yeah. as a, and then it's it's short enough that it's not that big of a commitment. Maybe it's a couple of nights, maybe three nights, maybe potentially four tops, where we play like an hour or two nights and nights, and then you, you're done. Then it's all it's all it's all done. Uh, it's not a full blown campaign. It's not a full blown commitment. So it is something you're interested in. Drop me a line. Let me know. Yeah, I think that's us. If you want to finish the rest for closing, I don't know. And I get it. Uh, we'll let we'll let Chris get back to work. Sean, always good talking to you, my friend. Yep, it's good to be here, and uh, hopefully within the next week or two, I'll have my stuff settled down and can say, hey, I'm actually doing something with miniatures and things like that. So I'd like okay. to actually get a couple games of X-Wing in on the table, but I got to talk my son into it. So right <laughs> now he's, uh, right now he's you know, invested a lot in 40K, so that may be a little difficult, but... But uh, yeah, with Chris's, I understand that. I 100% Chris, understand that. And not to make this long, but Chris's storage idea actually hits home with me for X Wing. And I think I'm going to do the same thing because I still have everything in the literal uh, upgrade packs and, you know, the all that type mm. of stuff. So I haven't oh, even. The little boxes they used to give out and like the store kits? No, no, yeah. no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do. I have a. I have. What's the two sided box for magic storage? What's what's that one like? The eight hundred count. Is that an eight hundred? Uh, it's either four or eight, I think. Yeah. 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 Because so the four slot is sixteen. So. Yeah. So I have that. Uh, I have one of those with some um, commander decks in it, and so mm-hmm. I'll just add all the X wing stuff in it. So that's a yeah, good idea. Yeah, just got those ultimate guard. Um, dividers that you can get in different colors and then i know exactly what i'm looking at and it's nice and easy um i've got i've found a a good sleeve where i don't feel like i need to double sleeve them it's just the right thickness and everything for a tactile feel i like so i'll send you those as well if you like yeah that'd be great yep i can't remember what we're called now uh, what i'll do I'll actually put a link in the episode description as well for anyone who cares, because if I say I'll post it next time, I'll forget. So, <laughs> yep, yeah, send it to me. But always yep, good talking to you, my friend, Chris. Yep, 
It's always good to be at home and sometimes here in the store. This is a first. We've not done one like this before. The last time we did one that wasn't in home studios a long time ago. Long, long time. Yeah. All right. So that's going to do it. Do appreciate you guys turning in. And until next time, guys, as always, fly casual. Yay. All right, Chris, you can go to work. Thank you once again for joining the Lack of Focus X-Wing podcast. Check out Dice Hate Productions for all the latest episodes, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you again next episode.